The Junius Pamphlet by Rosa Luxemburg, Chapter 6. Of equal importance is the attitude of the social democracy <clears throat> was the official adoption of a program of civil peace, i.e. the cessation of the class struggle for the duration of the war. The declaration that was read by the Social Democratic Group in the Reichstag on the 4th of August had been agreed upon in advance with representatives of the government and the capitalist parties. It was little more than a patriotic grandstand play, prepared behind the scenes and delivered for the benefit of the people at home and in other nations. To the leading elements in the labor movement, the vote in favor of the war credits by the Reichstag group was a cue for the immediate settlement of all labor controversies. Nay, more, they announced this to be the manufacturers as a patriotic duty incurred by labor when it agreed to observe a civil peace. These same labor leaders undertook to supply city labor to farmers in order to assure a prompt harvest. The leaders of the Social Democratic Women's Movement united with capitalist women for national service and placed the most important elements that remained after the mobilization at the disposal of national Samaritan work. Socialist women worked in soup kitchens and on advisory commissions instead of carrying on agitation work for the party. <clears throat> Under the anti-socialist laws, the party had utilized parliamentary elections to spread its agitation and to keep a firm hold upon the population in spite of the state of siege that had been declared against the party and the persecution of the socialist press. In this crisis, the social democratic movement has voluntarily relinquished all propaganda and education in the interest of the proletarian class struggle during Reichstag and Landtag elections. Parliamentary elections have everywhere been reduced to the simple bourgeois formula, the catching of votes for the candidates of the party on the basis of an amicable and peaceful settlement with its capitalist opponents. When the Social Democratic representatives in the Landtag and in the municipal commissions, with the laudable exceptions of the Prussian and Alsadian Landtag, with high-sounding references to the existing state of civil peace, voted their approval of the war credits that had been demanded. It only emphasized how completely the party had broken with things as they were before the war. The social democratic press, with a few exceptions, proclaimed the principle of national unity as the highest duty of the German people. It warned the people not to withdraw their funds from the savings banks, lest by, so, by so doing, they unbalance the economic life of the nation. <clears throat> and hinder the savings banks in liberally buying war loan bonds. It pleaded with proletarian women that they should spare their husbands at the front the tales of suffering that they and their children were being forced to undergo, to bear in silence the neglect of the government, to cheer the fighting warriors with happy stories of family life and favorable reports of prompt assistance through government agencies. They rejoiced that the educational work that had been conducted for so many years in and through the labor movement had become a conspicuous asset in conducting the war. Something of this spirit the following example will show. A friend in need is a friend indeed. This old adage has once more proven its soundness. The social democratic proletariat has been prosecuted and clubbed for its opinions, went like one man to protect our homes. <clears throat> German labor unions that had so often suffered both in Germany and in Prussia report unanimously that the best of their members have joined the colors. <clears throat> Even capitalist papers like the General Anzeiger note the fact and express the conviction that these people will do their duty as well as any man, that blows will rain most heavily where they stand. As for us, we are convinced that our labor unionists can do more than deal out blows. Modern mass armies have by no means simplified the work of their generals. It is practically impossible to move forward large troop divisions in close marching order under the deadly fire of modern artillery. Ranks must be carefully widened, must be more accurately controlled. Modern war warfare requires discipline and clearness of vision, not only in the divisions, but in every individual soldier. The war will show how vastly human material has been improved by the educational work of the labor unions, how well their activity will serve the nation in these times of awful stress. 
The Russian and the French soldier may be capable of marvelous deeds of bravery, but in cool, collected consideration, none will surpass the German labor unionists. Then, too, many of our organized workers know the ways and byways of the borderland as well as they know their own pockets, and not a few of them are accomplished linguists. The Prussian advance in 1866 has been termed a schoolmaster's victory. This will be a victory of labor union leaders. In the same strain, Newsite, the theoretical organ of the party, declared, until the question of victory or defeat has been decided, all doubts must disappear, even as to the cause of the war. Today, there can be no difference of party, class, and nationality within the army or the population. And in number eight of uh, November 27th, 1914, the same Newsite declared in a chapter on the limitations of the international, the world war divides the socialists of the world into different camps, and especially into different national camps. The international cannot prevent this. In other words, the international ceases to be an effective instrument in times of war. It is, on the whole, a peace instrument. Its great historic problem is the struggle for peace and the class struggle in times of peace. Briefly, therefore, beginning with the 4th of August until the day when peace shall be declared, the social democracy has declared the class struggle extinct. The first thunder of Krupp cannons in Belgium welded Germany into a wonderland of class solidarity and social harmony. How is this miracle to be understood? The class struggle is known to be not a social democratic invention that can be arbitrarily set aside for a period of time whenever it may seem convenient to do so. The proletarian class struggle is older than the social democracy, is an elementary product of class society. If flamed up all over Europe when capitalism first came into power, the modern proletariat was not led by the social democracy into the class struggle. On the contrary, the international social democratic movement was called into being by the class struggle to bring a conscious aim and unity into the various local and scattered fragments of the class struggle. What then has changed in this respect when the war broke out? Have private property, capitalist exploitation, and class rule ceased to exist? Or have the propertied classes in a spell of patriotic fervor declared, in view of the needs of the war, we hereby turn over the means of production, the earth, the factories, and the mills therein, into the possession of the people? Have they relinquished the right to make profits out of these possessions? Have they set aside all political privileges? Will they sacrifice them upon the altar of the fatherland, now that it is in danger? It is, to say the least, a rather naive hypothesis and sounds almost like a story from a kindergarten primer. And yet the, de the declaration of our official leaders that the class struggle has been suspended permits no other interpretation. Of course, nothing of the sort has occurred. Property rights, exploitation and class rule, even political oppression and all its Prussian thoroughness have remained intact. The canons in Belgium and in Eastern Prussia have not had the slightest influence upon the fundamental social and political structure of Germany. <clears throat> the cessation of the class struggle was, therefore, a deplorably one-sided affair. While capitalist oppression and exploitation, the worst enemies of the working class, remain, socialist and labor union leaders have generously, generously delivered the working class without a struggle into the hands of the enemy for the duration of the war. While the ruling classes are fully armed with the property and supremacy rights, the working class, at the advice of the social democracy, has laid down its arms. Once before, in 1848, in France, the proletariat experienced this miracle of class harmony, this fraternity of all classes of a modern capitalist state of society. In his class struggles in France, Karl Marx writes, <coughs> In the eyes of the proletariat, who confused the moneyed arist aristocracy with the bourgeoisie in the imagination of republican idealists, who denied the very existence of classes or attributed them to a monarchical form of government, and the deceitful phrases of those bourgeois who had hitherto been excluded from power, the rule of the bourgeoisie was ended when the republic was proclaimed. At that time, all royalists became republican, all millionaires in Paris became laborers. In the word fraternité, the brotherhood of man, this imaginary destruction of classes found official expression. 
This comfortable abstraction from class differences, this sentimental balancing of class interests, this utopian disregard of the class struggle, this fraternité was the real slogan of the February rev Revolution. The Parisian proletariat rejoiced in an orgy of brotherhood. The Parisian proletariat, looking upon the Republic as its own creation, naturally acclaimed every act of the provisional bourgeois government. Willingly, it permitted Cossidier to use its members as policemen to protect the property of Paris. With unquestioning faith, it allowed Louis Blanc to regulate wage differences between workers and masters. In their eyes, it was a matter of honor to preserve the fair name of the Republic before the peoples of Europe. Thus, in February 1848, a naive Parisian proletariat set aside the class struggle. But let us not forget that even they committed this mistake only after the July monarchy had been crushed by their revolutionary action, after a republic had been established. The 4th of August 1914 is an inverted February revolution. It is the setting aside of class differences, not under a republic, but under a military monarchy, not after a victory of the people over reaction, but after a victory of reaction over the people, not with the proclamation of liberté, égalité, fraternité, but with the proclamation of a state of siege, after the press had been choked and the constitution annihilated. Impressively, the government of Germany proclaimed a civil peace, Solemnly, the parties promised to abide by it, but as experienced politicians, these gentlemen know full well that it is fatal to trust too much to promises. They secured civil peace for themselves by the very real measure of a military dictatorship. This, too, the Social Democratic group accepted without protest or opposition. In the declarations of August 4th and December 2nd, there is not a syllable of indignation over the affront contained in the proclamation proclamation of military rule. When it voted for civil peace and war credits, the social democracy silent, silently gave its consent to military rule as well, and laid itself, bound and gagged, at the feet of the ruling classes. The declaration of military rule was purely an anti-socialist measure. From no other side were resistance, protest, action, and difficulties to be expected. As a reward for its capitulation, the social democracy merely received what it would have received under any circumstances, even after an unsuccessful resistance, namely military rule. The impressive declaration of the Reichstag group emphasizes the old socialist principle of the right of nations to self-determination as an explanation of their vote in favor of war credits. Self-determination for the German proletariat was the straitjacket of a siege. Never in the history of the world has a party made itself more ridiculous. But more. In refuting the existence of the class struggle, the social democracy has denied the very basis of its own existence. What is the very breath of its body, if not the class struggle? What role could it expect to play in the war, once having sacrificed the class struggle, the fundamental principle of its existence? The social democracy has destroyed its mission for the period of the war as an active political party, as a representative of working class politics. It has thrown aside the most important weapon it possessed, the power of criticism of the war from the peculiar point of view of the working class. Its only mission now is to play the role of the gendarme over the working class under a state of military rule. German freedom, that same German freedom for which according to the declaration of the Reichstag group, Krupp cannons are now fighting, has been endangered by this attitude of the social democracy far beyond the period of the present war. The leaders of the social democracy are convinced that democratic liberties for the working class will come as a reward for its allegiance to the fatherland. But never in the history of the world has an oppressed class received political rights as a reward for service rendered to the ruling classes. History is full of examples of shameful deceit on the part of the ruling classes, even when solemn promises were made before the war broke out. The social democracy has not assured the extension of liberty in Germany. It has sacrificed those liberties that the working class possessed before the war broke out. The indifference with which the German people have allowed themselves to be deprived of the freedom of the press, of the right of assembly and of public life, the fact that they not only calmly bore, but even applauded the state of siege is unexampled 
in the history of modern society. In England, the freedom of the press has nowhere been violated. In France, there is incomparably more freedom of public opinion than in Germany. In no country has public opinion so completely vanished. Nowhere has it been so completely superseded by official opinion, by the order of the government, as in Germany. Even in Russia, there is only the destructive work of a public censor who effectively wipes out opposition of opinion. But not even there have they descended to the custom of providing articles ready for the press to the opposition papers. In no other country has the government forced the opposition press to express in its columns the politics they, that have been dictated and ordered by the government in confidential conferences. Such measures were unknown even in Germany during the War of 1870. At that time, the press enjoyed unlimited freedom and accompanied the events of the war to Bismarck's active resentment with criticism that was often exceedingly sharp. The newspapers were full of active discussion on war aims, on questions of annexation and constitutionality. When Johann Jacobi was arrested, a storm of indignation swept over Germany, so that even Bismarck felt obliged to disavow all responsibility for this mistake of the powers of reaction. Such was the situation in Germany at a time when Bebel and Libnicht, in the name of the German working class, had declined all community of interests with the ruling Jingos. It took a social democracy with four and a half million votes to conceive of the touching Bergfrieden to assent to war credits, to bring upon us the worst military dictatorship that was ever suffered to exist. That such a thing is possible in Germany today had not only the bourgeois press, but the highly developed and influential socialist press as well, permits these things without even the pretense of opposition bears a fatal significance for the future of German liberty. It proves that society in Germany today has within itself no foundation for political freedom, since it allows itself to be thus lightly deprived of its most sacred rights. Let us not forget that the political rights that existed in Germany before the war were not won, as were those of France and England, and great and repeated revolutionary struggles are not firmly anchored in the lives of the people by the power of revolutionary tradition. They are the gift of a, of a Bismarckian policy granted after a period of victorious counter-revolution that lasted over 20 years. German liberties did not ripen on the field of revolution. They are the product of diplomatic gambling by Prussian military monarchy. They are the cement with which this military monarchy has united the present German empire. Danger threatens the free development of German freedom, not as the German Reichstag group believes from Russia, but in Germany itself. It lies in the peculiar counter-revolutionary origin of the German constitution and looms dark in the reactionary powers that have controlled the German state since the empire was founded, conducting a silent but relentless war against these pitiful German liberties. The Junkers at East of the Elbe, the business jingos, the arch reactionaries of the center, the degraded German liberals, the personal rulership, the sway of the sword, the Zabern policy that triumphed all over Germany before the war broke out. These are the real enemies of culture and liberty. And the war, the state of siege, and the attitude of the social democracy are strengthening the powers of darkness all over the land. The liberal, to be sure, can explain away this graveyard quietly in Germany with a characteristically liberal explanation. To him, it is only a temporary sacrifice for the duration of the war. But to a people that are politically ripe, a sacrifice of their rights and their public life, even temporarily, is as impossible as for a human being to give up, for a time, his right to breathe. A people that gives silent consent to military government in times of war thereby admit that political independence at any time is superfluous. The passive submission of the social democracy to the present state of siege and its vote for war credits without attaching the slightest condition thereto, its acceptance of a civil peace, has demoralized the masses. The only existing pillar of German constitutional government has strengthened the reaction of its rulers, the enemies of constitutional government. By sacrificing the class struggle, our party has moreover, once and for all, given up the possibility of making its influence effectively felt in determining the extent of the war and the terms of peace. To its own official declaration, its acts have been a stinging blow. While protesting against all annexations, which are, after all, the logical consequences of an imperialist war that is successful from the military point of view, 
It has handed over every weapon that the working class possessed that might have empowered the masses to mobilize public opinion in their own direction, to exert an effective pressure upon the terms of war and of peace. By assuring militarism of peace and quiet at home, the social democracy has given its military rulers permission to follow their own course without even considering the interests of the masses, has unleashed in the hearts of the ruling classes the most unbridled imperialistic tendencies. In other words, when the social democracy adopted its platform of civil peace and the political disarmament of the working class, it condemned its own demand of no annexations to impotence. Thus, the social democracy has added another crime to the heavy burden it already has to bear, namely the lengthening of the war. The commonly accepted dogma that we can oppose the war only so long as it, it is threatened has become a dangerous trap. As an inevitable consequence, once the war has come, social democratic political action is at an end. There can be then but one question, victory or defeat, i.e. the class struggle must stop for the period of the war, but actually the greatest problem for the political movement of the social democracy begins only after the war has broken out. At the international congresses held in Stuttgart in 1907 and in Basel in 1912, the German party and labor union leaders unanimously voted in favor of a resolution which says, should war nevertheless break out, it shall be the duty of the social democracy to work for a speedy peace and to strive with every means in its power to utilize the industrial and political crisis to accomplish the awakening of the people, thus hastening the overthrow of the capitalist class rule. What has the social democracy done in this war? Exactly the contrary. By voting in favor of war credits and entering upon a civil peace, it has striven by all the means in its power to prevent the industrial and political crisis, to prevent an awakening of the masses by the war. It strives with all the means in its power to save the capitalist state from its own anarchy to reduce the number of its victims. It is claimed, we have often heard this argument used by Reichstag deputies, that no one man less, that not one man less would have fallen upon the battlefields if the social democratic group had voted against the war credits. Our party press has steadfastly maintained that we must support and join in the defense of our country in order to reduce the number of bloody victims that this war shall cost. But the policy that we have followed out has had the exact had exactly the opposite effect. In the first place, thanks to the civil peace and the patriotic attitude of the social democracy, the imperialist war unleashed its furies without fear. Hitherto, fear of restiveness at home, fear of the fury of the hungry populace have been a load upon the minds of the ruling classes that effectively checked them in their bellicose desires. In the well-known words of Bulow, they are trying to put off the war chiefly because they fear the social democracy. Rohrbach says in his Krieg und die Deutsche Politik, page 7, Unless elemental catastrophes intervene, the only power that can force Germany to make peace is the hunger of the breadless. Obviously, he meant a hunger that attracts attention, that forces itself unpleasantly upon the ruling classes in order to force them to pay heed to its demands. Let us see finally what a prominent military theoretician, General Bernardi, says in his great work, Vom Hütigen Krieg. Thus, modern mass armies make war difficult for a variety of reasons. Moreover, they constitute in and of themselves a danger that must never be underestimated. The mechanism of such an army is so huge and so complicated that it can remain efficient and flexible only so long as its cogs and wheels work in the main, dependably, an obvious moral confusion is carefully prevented. These are things that cannot be com completely avoided as little as, as little as we can conduct a war exclusively with victorious battles. They can be overcome if they appear only within certain restricted limits. But when great, compact masses once shake off their leaders, when a spirit of panic becomes widespread, when a lack of sustenance becomes extensively felt, when the spirit of revolt spreads out among the masses of the army, then the army becomes not only ineffectual against the enemy, it becomes a menace to itself and to its leaders. 
When the army bursts the bands of discipline, when it voluntarily interrupts the course of military operation, it creates problems that its leaders are, are unable to solve. War with its modern mass armies is, under all circumstances, a dangerous game, a game that demands the greatest possible sacrifice, personal and financial sacrifice the state can offer. Under such circumstances, it is clear that provision must be made everywhere that the war, once it is broken out, be brought to an end as quickly as possible to release the extreme tension that must accompany this supreme effort on the part of whole nations. Thus, capitalist politicians and military authorities alike believe war with its modern mass armies to be a dangerous game, and therein lay for the social democracy the most effectual opportunity to prevent the rulers of the present day from precipitating war and to force them to end it as rapidly as possible. But the position of the social democracy in this war cleared away all doubts, has torn down the dams that held back the storm flood of militarism. In fact, it has created a power for which neither Bernardi nor any other capitalist statesman dared hope in his wildest dreams. From the camp of the Social Democrats came the cry, Dirt Schalten, see it through, i.e. the continuation of this human slaughter, and so the thousands of victims that have fallen for months on battlefields lie, lie upon our conscience. <laughs>